However, Harding, Warren G. Harding, President Harding, had a a uh, scandal called the Teapot Dome scandal. And to put it in a nutshell, it's a pretty complicated scandal. But to to sum it up for you, um, there was a lot of corruption in the Harding administration, um, <coughs> and this was sort of the one that is the straw that broke the camel's back. The Secretary of the Interior, who was appointed by the President, approved by Congress, was caught taking a $300,000 bribe to have an area of a national park, which was known as a teapot, because it dome, because it was a strange-shaped hill, to uh, to have that part of a national park um, developed by private developers, and he was going to sell off the rights to that because he took a huge bribe. And it harmed the Harding administration. Then Calvin Coolidge was elected, another Republican. And Calvin Coolidge believed in laissez-faire politics. Laissez-faire is a French word which kind of means hands-off. And really, laissez-faire politics means the government's going to stay out of the way of business. Hands-off government. We let business do what it does. What's good for business is good for America, they used to say during this time period. And one of the things they did was create the Kellogg-Briand Pact. This was a, a foreign policy pact. In this foreign policy agreement, 15 different nations pledged not to use the threat of war against each other. The thing about pacts and agreements is uh, people can ignore them. And the problem with the Kellogg-Briand Pact is there was no way to be for it to be enforced. Nobody said, if one of these nations does threaten war against the others, then the other 14 nations will punish it. There was no punishment involved. It was just a pledge, just a promise that we're not going to do this. For business in America, it was pretty good. Um, there was a, a lot of money floating around, particularly in the middle class and the upper class. You can see some advertisements of the time period for fashion. Um, in America, the economy in America use, slowly became a consumer economy, which meant that if people were buying things and consumers were spending money, the economy was strong. And this was a time when consumers spent a lot of money. Um, the economy grew quickly. And people began to spend quickly. We'll talk about in a minute things that some innovations in financing that made this possible. One of those things is credit, which meant that you could open up a line of credit at a store, and you could use an installment plan, and the customer pays regular amounts over time. No such thing as credit cards yet. That would come eventually uh, within 20 years. But this is just credit at a store where you would open a line of credit. They would have a credit department that would keep track of those accounts. Electric power was now being delivered to most homes in the United States, and that opened up a lot of opportunities. If you look at this top right, this is a toaster. Uh, this is a lighting fixture, a refrigerator, a waffle maker, a clock, another toaster, a dishwasher, coffee maker. Do not know what that is. Washing machine, mixer, lamp. So you can see all the different things that were available to housewives. This is a refrigerator with a compressor on top. Here's a uh, washing machine. With, they didn't have a dryer yet, so you just squeezed it through this thing. Appliances were in demand, and whatever you could make to make the home more uh, modern, to make it easier for the housewife, uh, people bought those things. Um, and it was made possible by wiring in the walls, um, by electrical wiring. There were still pockets of the United States that did not have that did not have electricity, particularly in rural mountain areas. But if you lived in the city, you were wired. And let's give you an example. In 1925, only four percent of farms in the United States had electricity. That is a rural area. But if you looked in the city, you'd probably get about 80 percent of the homes with electricity, and 100 percent of the homes in most cities had access to it. But some people couldn't afford it or didn't want it. Um, the, the company that benefited the most, which became the largest corporation in the United States, was General Electric. Advertising also grew. In advertising, you can see uh, that in most advertising, there was lots of writing because there was no such thing as TV. So when you sat down to look at an advertisement, you read. Um, you're going to sell those new products. You're going to appeal to people's likes, their interests, and emotions. You're going to use celebrities like... Uh, Judy Garland here from uh, The Wizard of Oz. And that's where we'll end. We'll continue this lecture in class.